Okay, this is a 22nd lesson. 11 times 2, William Howard Taft in the Bull Moose election of 1912. As I said last lesson, we talked about the Bull Moose election um, across a number of different uh, uh, slides because it's relevant to all three um, progressive presidents. In fact, they all run against each other in 1912. Here we go, here we go why it's relevant to, to talk about it um, in, all, in regards to all three presidents. But what you need to know is this. Roosevelt had promised in 1904 that he would not seek a second term. And in 1908, he steps down and his hand-picked successor, his a close ally and friend, William Howard Taft, is given the Republican nomination and wins the presidency quite handily um, against William Jennings Bryan. Um, the 27th president of the United States um, is William Howard Taft. He's a one-term president, an unusual fact, an unusual thing. Most U.S. presidents tend to get the second term after being elected. Um, that's a lot to do with familiarity, a lot to do with the fact that you can set the agenda generally in your first year. But anyways, this is not American politics course. All you need to know is that he doesn't get a second term, and we'll find out why Okay, a little bit later on. Uh, Taft very much was a supporter of Roosevelt. He was sort of the man to carry the torch. He supported this, uh, the idea of the square deal in giving employers and employees a, let's say, a balance in their relationship, where it had always been, of course, favoring the employers. Um, he soon, however, finds that it's quite possible to please, to please everyone. There are a lot of conservatives in the United States government, let alone the Republican Party, who were okay with what Roosevelt did, but were leery of going too far. Taft lacked the ability to be everybody's favorite person. Roosevelt was incredibly charismatic. Taft was a little bit more of a politician and more of a more of a lawyer type. Uh, very much, um, how do I say? Very pedantic. Very by the book. He wasn't necessarily the warm and cuddly man of, of great speeches and charisma that Roosevelt had been. In the end, Taft will mostly due to the realities of the time, end up satisfying the conservative elements of the Republican Party and angering the progressive. Um, that said, though, um, it would be wrong to write off Taft as a conservative, not a progressive, because his administration pursues quite a few more antitrust suits, for example, than Roosevelt had. Now, the Republican Party is uh, and Taft is best known for splitting it in half. Okay. He benefited massively in 1908 by Roosevelt's endorsement, and it was expected by most people that he would carry on the progressive policies. Of course, he was not bound to things such as the deal that Roosevelt had been bound to with J.P. Morgan in 1907, and therefore it was felt that Taft could take it in the natural next step. Um, he will do the opposite in some cases. He'll appoint conservatives to several key government posts. Um, the most notable one is the Secretary of the Interior, a person responsible for all matters having to do with um, the domestic policies and the domestic uh, uh, federal government's interest in domestic affairs in the United States, of course, one of which will be conservation. Uh, Ballinger will be accused of colluding with private businesses to release, for instance, valuable La Alaskan coal fields for development, which had been earmarked for conservation by the Roosevelt administration. Uh, Taft, when this uh, was pressured, I suppose, when this came out to fire Ballinger, um, and he takes a quite a strong position against a man named Gifford Pinchot, who was Roosevelt's appointed head of the former services. And this effectively breaks um, the sort of the alliance between Roosevelt's progressive supporters and Taft, who seems to side with the conservatives. Another big issue for Taft was he betrayed one of his key platform pledges. Roosevelt had sort of been quiet on the idea of the tariff issue, but Ta Taft had sort of had basically pledged in his campaign that he would finally reduce tariffs on uh, goods coming into the United States. What he does when he becomes president is quite the opposite. Though he does reduce tariffs somewhat, he doesn't go far enough. In fact, he barely goes far at all. He passes what's known as the Payne Aldrich tariff. This is a 40% tariff. Um, and in some cases, that 40% tariff didn't apply to all imported goods. That 40% tariff only applied to, um, let's just say, manufactured products. Raw, raw materials coming into the country, uh, food stuff stuffs coming into the country were still taxed at the previous 54%. Um, in fact, the final legislation, if you read the finer details, actually increased some tariffs. One of the big things that increased tariffs on was imported oil into the United States. And as a result, the Payne Aldrich tariff, which um, was maligned <coughs> by all progressives, actually isn't the great reduction in tariffs that people have been calling for in the United States ever since really the populist movement had emerged in the West. Um, it proved to be, I suppose, in many cases, the first in an ominous series of debacles for the Taft, Taft administration. 
So moving on to the next of the uh, controversies, this is the Ballinger Pinchot controversy. Um, Pinchot was the head of the Forest Service. Now, obviously, the Forest Service is one of the progressive era um, uh, sort of administrations designed for protecting the wildlife, protecting the natural forests, which, as you remember from a previous lesson, um, were increasingly getting cut down in the spirit of industrialization. So this was a crown jewel almost in the Roosevelt um, national parks retain the environment, retain the wild um, role, um, and therefore was naturally um, Pinchot was naturally a sort of ally of um, Roosevelt and someone who Roosevelt naturally supported. Now, he alleged Pinchot alleged that the Secretary of the Interior, rough equivalent of Home Secretary, but very roughly, um, uh, who was responsible for amongst other things um, the uh, what happens to natural resources and much of the la federal land um, owned by the federal government was alleged to have been um, making friends and colluding with big business, particularly lumber companies and mining companies, who, if they could get access to land um, <coughs> currently owned by the federal government or stopped from being mined and have wood cut down by federal reforms, <coughs> then we will find they can make lots of money. So he, Banjo was accused of taking a huge bribe, both in shares and cash, in order to give um, certain companies access or permission to make this um, uh, land and mine it, essentially. Um, Taft investigates it, but found no evidence. It must be, must be argued that Taft, while he did sincerely investigate it, he didn't necessarily put lots of time or resources or the best men into it. Um, it was more of a passive internal investigation within the Republican Party um, as opposed to a sort of structured public inquiry, although they only exist in America, particularly at the time. Um, and since he didn't remain convinced, he took no action. So for him, the, this was a sort of governmental dispute, interdepartmental. The departments always have disputes with each other all the time, one person or another person, but so far, so far, he doesn't really worry too much. However, Pinchot decides to leak this story to the press. Um, and this called for, and also called, sorry, for a, a congressional investigation, taking out the investigators from the executive branch, who Taft thought was, I'm sorry, who Pichot thought Taft was too kind and pointed to someone who really didn't investigate too much, to Congress, who is more willing to at least make Taft look bad by doing a proper investigation. Now, Taft sees this as betrayal. Pichot works for Taft, and here's Pinchot not only ignoring the investigation, which Taft said was fine, but going out and making Taft look bad and make problems with Taft. However, by firing Pinchot, this became a symbolic issue for the progressives, an issue of how Taft has betrayed the cause, betrayed what Roosevelt stood for, and becomes probably more than perhaps is reasonable, um, a symbol of how far things have come since the good old days of Roosevelt. And this really angers um, Roosevelt in particular. Um, and so this is one of, uh, along with the tariff, a real sort of rallying call but to get people on site and symbolise the changes on the tap more than anything else. Um, interestingly, though, if we look at his record as progressive, this is him being attacked as progressive. Arguably, he's more effective than Teddy Roosevelt, particularly in trust busting. Um, Taft takes on no, numerous of the most more powerful corporations. For Standard Oil, who Roosevelt had ignored because he, they were a quote unquote a good trust, um, were to be broken up under the Taft administration uh, under the Sherman Antitrust Act. Um, they, they broke up into those who market, those who refine, those who produce. Now this isn't perfect because in reality um, the Rockefeller estate controls large chunks of this, these three companies, although arguably it's harder to sort of do the same sort of gouging and price control um, than before. Um, the, as well as this, more important, more critically, if you remember from previous lessons, Roosevelt had made a deal with JP Morgan to retain US Steel as their monopoly, where Taft goes in and basically um, argues that the acquisition of the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company was illegal. Now this uh, undermines Roosevelt's word, this undermines his promise he made to um, uh, Morgan, and therefore argue, and for a man who really values his word, really personally insults him, because Roosevelt knows that Taft is well aware that Roosevelt made this deal, and Taft has chosen to ignore Roosevelt's honour, Roosevelt's um, word, and still carry on with probably the quite right breaking up our challenges in the US Steel. So, um, therefore, Roosevelt finds this personal affront more than just simply about, um, about what happens to a particular um, uh, trust. It's <clears throat> it is about um, Taft betraying the word that Roosevelt made. 
Um, we also see the Interstate Commerce Commission strengthened, which is designed to give more powers to regulate these sort of bodies, although it's still not hugely powerful. And the Department of Labor was create, created, designed to at least give the, in, uh, the lip service to the interests and the concerns of uh, organized labor. But in reality, the bosses still rule, rule supreme. Um, again, as well as that, the American Tobacco Company really um, gets attacked um, by the Supreme Court, or paid um, challenged by the government in court, um, who are using quite brutal gouging mechanism to cut prices to the point that smaller competing businesses couldn't compete. So there is real attack on far more than Teddy Roosevelt on the rich, powerful plutocrats. Okay, um, the 16th Amendment is one of the achievements of the Taft administration. The 16th Amendment is the introduction of a graduated income tax on American citizens. Up until this point, you know that the primary way in which the Americans gain or are able, American federal government, that is, is able to get money in order to pay for things like the military, et cetera, et cetera, um, is through the tariff. And as a result, tariffs remain quite high. Now, in light of the fact that Taft was supposed to be lo lowering the tariff, something which he doesn't necessarily really do in the pain Aldrich tariff, though he does lower it to some degree, the government needed a way to increase revenue. And as a result, um, Taft was able to get past the 16th Amendment. This tax would help modernize the expanding federal government. It would provide it with a stable source of revenue that wasn't dependent on good and bad years economically, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and it also met one of the key progressive movement's goals. Number one, that there would be a graduated income tax, which taxes the rich instead of the poor, and it would help with that lower tariff push, which of course was believed to lead to more open competition in the marketplace, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what is the significance of the 16th Amendment? Well, uh, in 1894, um, Congress had tried to pass another income tax, but in 1894, the Supreme Court had quickly rejected it as unconstitutional. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Fuller, at that time, argued that the Constitution's framers had intended that, the, quote, the power of direct taxation would be exercised in, in only extraordinary exigencies. Another word I can't say. What that effectively means is in the times of war or some major uh, crisis, would there only be income tax? But since America was at peace, income tax must not be allowed to serve as a potentially put ordinary and usual means of supply. Therefore, in order to pass a constitutional amendment, okay, the increase of an income tax or the addition of an income tax, which is now a constitutional issue because the Supreme Court had ruled on it and said that it was a violation of human rights uh, or the sort of the fundamental freedoms of America meant that all of the states had to ratify it. So not by 1913, um, though it goes through in the Taft's uh, administration, the uh, 16th Amendment is passed, okay? It goes through Congress, both houses, uh, and then it goes and is finally ratified by all the states. Um, the passing of the 16th Amendment is probably the greatest achievement in terms of the difficulty of passage, its significance in relation to progressive goals, and the scope as it affected most Americans. And it would arguably be, if in an argument about Taft's effectiveness, the number one reason why Taft is considered a successful progressive president by some. The legacy of Taft, therefore, needs to be summed up like this, okay? Like all progressive presidencies, his legacy is mixed. On the good side, he does reduce tariffs, albeit not that much. He gets the 16th Amendment um, passed through. He doesn't get rid of all conservation lands, even though the, uh, the Ballinger-Pinchot controversy tends to get blown out of proportion. Um, he t t attacks, and successfully so, trusts more than Theodore Roosevelt or Wilson, his successor, would do. Notably, he attacks the two biggest ones, the United States Steel Company um, and uh, uh, Amer the American Tobacco, and American Tobacco. Not necessarily the biggest one, but two very big ones. Um, and his progressivism was a popular enough that basically, from you know, for the 1912 election, you could not be successful or you could not even be a candidate for president of the United States unless you were a progressive. And in, 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 in this way, Taft, by passing so much and being so tough, endeared himself to the people to such a degree that everybody needed to change their policy to be in some ways progressive. Okay, so... Oh, wait, wait a second. On the bad side. I haven't told about the bad things. Okay. okay. Number one, he does give away valuable conference conservation land. He didn't reduce tariffs enough to satisfy the progressive ideals. And by sort of betraying Roosevelt's legacy, he splits the Republican Party. Many would argue he threatened to end progressivism, though his successor, Woodrow Wilson, would carry the progressive torch. Um, Roosevelt, 
joins what in the 1912 election, the Progressive Party, because he fears that Taft is too conservative. Okay, back to Mr. Souter. Hooray! Um, so, um, the 1912 election, often described as the Bull Moose election because of the rise of um, uh, what's his name there? Teddy Roosevelt, <laughs> the important guy we've talked about the whole time. Um, uh, his, as a third party candidate, um, is I uh, want this very, very often comes up in exams, and generally it comes across the lines of either why was there a freeway election, uh, or why did um, Roosevelt decide to run, um, so therefore why was there a split in the Republican Party, or why did Wilson win? So it's important for us to have a look at both what causes the split, but also the natures and the strengths and weaknesses of each side. So what we see... Can, can I just add something? It's also important in the Bull Moose election to talk about terminology in, in contrast to the platforms. We had mentioned that Theodore Roosevelt had something known as New Nationalism. Well, of course, New Nationalism rears its head in regards to the um, Republican, or sorry, the progressive platform in this election, and he will run up against what's known as the new freedom of the Democratic Party, which Mr. Sudo will explain to you in just a moment. Excellent. Um, so, the um, uh, Republican Party arguably has been splitting for, since the start of adopting progressivism, and arguably under um, uh, Roosevelt. But really, there's a, a the battle between the more progressive elements of Republicanism, who naturally uh, therefore align themselves with um, uh, Roosevelt, um, and Taft, who increasingly, even against his will, starts associating with the more traditional conservative elements of Republicanism, starts really in earnest in 1910. Um, Taft, in order, uh, partly because Cannon is in charge, decides that he's going to side with the Speaker of the um, House of Representatives, that's the mo one of the most important people in the lower house, equivalent to the House of Commons in um, uh, America, um, and side of him against the more progressive, more uh, ex sort of extreme uh, left-wing side of the party. This is partly a loyalty to his party. If you start siding with the non-conservative opposition, you can cause problems. But Taft also is more temperamentally supportive of the more conservative aspects. What this means, however, is that the Democrats and progressive Republicans form an alliance. Um, and therefore, it's very difficult for the key committees, and they're the bits which actually sort of look after, write and edit the laws which are passed, start ignoring canon and start following a more progressive line. And this is further punished by the midterms, that's sort of elections in between the cycle of um, presidential elections. So presidential elections every four years, but elections to the House of Representatives every two years. Um, uh, the GOP, the Republicans, lost control of the House, but the progressives actually did quite well. So this further put fewer con Republican conservatives in power and then meant it as hard to pass any laws. Um, and because Taft has sided with Cannon, the progressives refuse to side with Taft or help Taft on his um, laws. And worse than that, they start to plot against Taft. Now, obviously, if you're going to plot against Taft, you're going to need an alternative um, individual to run in the presidential election. The obvious candidate, therefore, is Roosevelt. However, before we talk about that, let's talk about what's happening to the Democrats. Because the Democrats, in reality, have been out of office for a significant chunk and, and irre irrelevant as electoral force for even longer. Since but, what, the 1880s? Yes, roughly then. Since um, Cleveland. Um, and even then, they weren't necessarily tip top. They were you know, flip flopping all about the place. The Democrats, however, are about to start properly here their long march to dominating and then eventually losing. Um, the centre ground. And it comes on this man called Woodrow Wilson. He is a southerner who then raised, uh, raised and pretty much did all most of his career in the north. He was governor of New Jersey and was a real reformer. He didn't massively reform stuff left wing stuff like working rights or stuff like that or minimum wage, but he was very good at cracking down on corruption. He was also um, the president of Princeton gave him a, um, an academic flair, made him look like someone who really had all the ideas. And that also naturally appealed to a base broader than the simple southern white redneck um, sort of Democrats. And so in reality, Woodrow Wilson is, yes, a Democrat, but he's one of the first candidates they put up who's you know, acceptable, not just to Normaners, but to progressives. Um, he particularly wins the leadership because um, Brian, if you remember, the man who challenged for several times for three, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, indeed, um, several times for the presidency himself, um, sided with um, Wilson, and the majority of people who would have voted, i.e., the progressive side for Brian, then move over their votes to Wilson. So 
he sells himself as a progressive breaks on. What that means is he's a progressive, but he doesn't go too far. This is as much internal politics. If you're in a Democratic Party, an alliance of the South and increasing progressive wings, um, you don't want to present yourself as too extreme. However, in reality, he does have a campaign which is really quite similar to Bryan's, massively challenging bits of business, massively challenging the privilege of the elites and people who currently control the economy and politics. And his program is often known as the New Freedom One. Stronger antitrust legislation, banking reform, tariff reductions, very anti-Northern Republican New York sort of platform, um, rather than trying to improve stuff like labor laws, working conditions, minimum wage and health care and that sort of stuff. So this is a platform which is definitely progressive, but choosing the parts of progressivism which is acceptable to a southern um, traditionalist base. Um, so he says, if we don't regulate, we just punish the people who break the law more, this will mean that we can um, have people actually properly doing capitalism rather than try and cheat the system. He sees trust and business monopolies as an evil that he's destroying not necessarily unpopular in the South, where there's not too many of these. And he also argues that tariffs will be totally reduced. If you remember, the South has always been against tariffs. So this is another popular issue. So Woodrow Wilson is definitely, and this is his real skill actually for me, he definitely navigating this image of a progressive, the image of this intelligent northern reforming governor of New Jersey, while at the same time still making sure that his southern base is kept in line and kept happy. And he is therefore very, very skillful. And always, why does Wilson win? We must always give Wilson credit for the fact that he manages this situation very well. So we should never underestimate both that Wilson was able to reposition the Democrats party into a far more progressive um, sort of mini. What's happening though in the Republican Party? Well, in reality, um, Roosevelt tries to gain the Republican nomination because of the splits we've mentioned. Um, in the 13 states which held the primaries, Roosevelt won uh, 278 delegates compared to 48 for tax. And so it's fairly clear that the rank and file Republicans support the average Republicans, what's here, Roosevelt. However, the party machine, and which is controlled by the conservative forces and have also paid for a lot by the big businesses to some extent, support Taft. Taft is a predictable man. He has not sold his soul to progressives even more than um, he did when he was in office. And therefore, actually, he's been showing himself as fairly as their guy. And there's a lot of hostility to Roosevelt, who many Republicans felt wasn't one of them and went too far, and only became president because he was lucky to have McKinley shot in the head when he was vice president in a job that was meant to keep him quiet. Um, at the first convention at Chicago, therefore, they nominate Taft on the first ballot. Now, this causes a massive stir. Roosevelt's followers say this is a fraud and storm at the convention. In reality, the reason you storm at the convention is you kind of know that the other guys are right, and if you, the more votes you call, the more obvious that is. So you storm out so there can't be a follow-up vote, or there can't be any clarification, so you can look like you have the moral high ground. So, we have Taft, who represents the elite sort of entrenched interest. We have Roosevelt, who's also a Republican, storms out, still thinking that he won, and with the legitimacy of pointing out that he's won the popular vote amongst um, his own rank and file. And therefore, we have Taft, who's with a platform saying, um, uh, sort of, a reduced tariff, but still protectionist, and tougher regulation. And then we have also Roosevelt on the side, um, calling for his own progressive reform. So the pro it's important to know that the progressives don't start as a consequence of Roosevelt, but it certainly helps. Um, in January 1911, a year before the elections, a number of Republican senators who had been on the Roosevelt side who started to hate Taft formed what was known as the Progressive Republican League. The idea is that they wanted to form a pressure group within the Republican Party to influence policy making um, to ensure that the progressive movement keeps, uh, keeps going. In other words, that progressive reforms uh, keep going in fear of the fact that they believe that Taft is undermining the progressive movement. They'll call for things like the direct election of senators, direct primaries, the use of the initiative and referendum and recall. A lot of the things that are sort of um, coming up, um, sort of been com uh, coming up throughout the progressive movement time. They are also so disheartened by Taft's actions, they decide actually that they cannot work within the Re a Republican Party that will endorse Taft. And in 1912, they decide that they're going to field a candidate for president that will run in a very similar Republican ilk, but in, under the guise of progressiveness. And they call themselves the Progressive Party. Their initial um, 
candidate for presidency is uh, Robert LaFollette of Wisconsin, a, a massive reformer who you are familiar with, of course, because we learned about him and his influence on city and state politics, particularly out of Wisconsin, and how he um, is able to reform uh, the system there, the, the, both the, 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 the electoral system in the, the state of Wisconsin. Um, La Follette is a national figure, but perhaps not as known as Roosevelt. But when Roosevelt finally splits with Taft and declares himself available after the Republican convention in Chicago in 1912, um, the, the progressives invite him to run for the progressive party. He secures their nomination. La Follette comes in second, and he runs again on his program of new nationalism. Now contrast that with Woodrow Wilson's new freedom. New nationalism effectively is big regulation. For new freedom on Woodrow Wilson's side is very similar. However, he doesn't want to regulate. He wants to uh, incarcerate. In other words, he will attack using the powers that exist, the existing trusts and corporations, not necessarily regulate them. And can I just point this, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, can I point out this is evidence of, sort of the Wilsonian political genius, because by saying we're going to do more enforcement rather than more regulation, you're keeping your right wing happy because you're not doing more regulation, and actually you can trust there's not going to be much actual reinforcement, but at the same time you're keeping your progressives happy because it sounds like you're going to do something productive to it. Mm. Now, this is, of course, as I mentioned earlier, known as the Bull Moose election because Roosevelt frames himself as a Bull Moose, a man of incredible power and, um, and stamina, such as the Bull Moose, which, uh, as far as I know, sleeps standing up. Anyways, make a long story short. Uh, Roosevelt gets associated with the Bull Moose. It, the progressives get known as the Bull Moose Party. This is the Bull Moose election. Uh, mostly because it sounds silly, I would think. But anyways, make a long story short. What happens is that those who vote Democrat still vote Democrat. Those who vote Republican get split between the two. And you have one of the remarkable presidential campaigns and presidential results in the history of America. The first Democrat is elected, Woodrow Wilson. The progressives split the Republican vote in two almost exactly. The Democrats gain control as a result of the House and the Senate. And Wilson becomes one of those rarities, a person who does not win the popular vote, especially when you consider that Roosevelt and Taft combined have more... Um, more uh, uh, more overall votes than Wilson does, but he wins a remarkable electoral college victory because they win uh, enough constituencies in the states to to carry an overwhelming majority in the electoral college, which gives him control of both the House and the Senate, which means that Wilson, in his first term, will have an incredibly easy time by comparison of passing laws because everybody in the House and the Senate is generally friendly to Wilson's ideas. It's also, and a lot of people uh, and historians will call this a watershed moment, a high point of progressivism. Every candidate in, the, in 1912 was at least in some essence progressives. In the case of Roosevelt and in the case of Wilson, they were out, outwardly progressive. Um, and when Wilson wins, okay, it's seen as now we have our third effective um, progressive president. Wilson will run and, and last two terms in office and go right into the 1920s. And we'll take the progressive torch from Taft and Roosevelt and run with it in new and great directions, if, if you will. Um, this uh, You can see the results for yourself on the right. One last thing before we sign off. Um, the Bull Moose election is also famous because you get the hatred between Roosevelt and Taft spewing out into the elections. And very funny enough, and actually pretty tame when you compare it to what politicians say these days, especially these days. But I always enjoy a little uh, a little old election humor. Here's some good jabs from the Bull Moose election. Roosevelt calling Taft over on the right, you are a fathead with the brain of a guinea pig. Actually, it's something I tell Mr. Souter quite often. And he often retorts that I am 280 <laughs> incredulous pounds of stupidity. <laughs> Anyways, Taft said, only death alone can take me now, 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 and he called Roosevelt a dangerous egotist and a demigod. It's good stuff. Just good stuff. Anyways, the public disagrees with the both of them, and Wolf Wilson became uh, president of the United States. Da, 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 da